Sing to him, church, and lift our voices. to him church then sings my soul my savior God to thee how great how great
sent him to die. I scarce can take it. glory and praise is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. God is good. Amen. Let's truly thank him one more time, shall we? So good to see you tonight. The Lord bless you richly, and we need to just pull me down just a little bit in the sanctuary here, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Uh, not all the way down, then, you know, but a little, you know. There we go. We're sounding better and better. Okay. Good to see everyone. How are you tonight? God is good. Amen. We're going to be celebrating communion. It's a wonderful time coming to the Lord's table. So if you are at home right now uh, and uh, you're with the family and so forth, I pray that you will go ahead and prepare the elements so you can celebrate communion, the Lord's table with us tonight as well. A lot of things happening. Uh, the ladies' luncheon tomorrow, 11.30 a.m. Uh, ladies at the Lone Star Antique Ball Tea Room. And all ladies are welcome. You can visit the app or the website for more information. Also, Heart to Heart Marriage Ministry this Saturday uh, in the cafe, 6.30 p.m. All married and soon-to-be-married couples uh, are invited. To find out more about all this, you can email Mario and Rhonda at hearttoheart at loveneverfails.com. Also, as I've been announcing this Sunday... 
uh, this coming Sunday, uh, we are finally, after all this time, since the beginning of the pandemic, we are relaunching the Kids Church First Service. So, boy, that's a blessing. I'm so glad to hear that. And so uh, you can bring your kiddos for that one now. It says teachers and helpers are still needed for both services, Sundays and Wednesdays. If you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved in the kids' church and serve the kiddos there, you can email danielle at loveneverfails.com. And their cleaning ministry, they also uh, are looking for some help on Sunday afternoons, and you can contact Debbie at loveneverfails.com as well. With all that being said, tonight we're going to be in Psalm uh, 85, 86, and 87, but we're going to start with Psalm 87, but before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you. We thank you for all that you're doing, O Lord, for there is none like you. Tonight, as we, it, that we have the privilege of celebrating the Lord's table until he returns. As I always pray, Lord, if we've sinned by word, deed, thought, action, grieved, quenched, vexed the Holy Spirit of God in any way, we run to the throne of grace, O Lord, and ask for forgiveness. And Lord, no doubt we have grieved the Spirit this week, vexed the Spirit this week, said things we shouldn't have said and thought things we shouldn't have thought. Lord God, you know that, we know that, and we come to you the only person that can wash away thoughts and words and deeds and actions and forever forget them. Oh, there's none like you. So, Lord, tonight, as we stand before you perfect in position but not in practice, we come to you and we love you, we praise you, for you are our Father which art in heaven, who sent his only begotten Son, O oh God, to die for our sins. We love you. And, Lord, tonight we pray over the difficulties not only in our own nation, but around this world, especially India, oh God, a miracle needs to take place. And Lord, maybe a miracle needs to take place tonight here in this chapel or those that are listening live. I pray over the sheep of your pastor, Lord, that somehow, some way, and secretly, as you always do, touch them in the areas of their life that they need that special touch in, Lord. We pray that if there's anyone here in the chapel or maybe in the other parts of the building, Lord, if Jesus is not their Lord, we claim them for your kingdom tonight. And let every spirit but the Holy Spirit be displaced from this place tonight. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and the church says, amen. amen. Let's turn to Psalm uh, 85, but we're going to start again with Psalm 87 tonight. Uh, by the psalm by the sons of Korah is only a few verses and we're going to quickly cover that because our main text tonight will be in the other two psalms but let me ask you a question as we look at psalm 87 do you have at like a special place that you love to go to in other words it could be some people they love to go to Colorado you know some people love to to go to Watauga for a break I don't know why but they just do they do things like that you know but Watauga is a wonderful place to live but it's not a place I want to hang out okay we all have special places don't we I, I love the hill country I also love to be in a cabin say up in Oklahoma up in the mountains and so forth you know we all have special places but God has a special place too it happens to be Jerusalem amen so this psalm tonight, as we look at this, the city of God, it says in verse 1 that his foundation, meaning God's, is in the holy mountains or the, or the hills of holiness. I like that better. And the Lord loves the gates of Zion or the gates of Mount Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Who owns the city of God, by the way? It says the city of God. It belongs to God. Amen. And he says, see law, Paul's right there. It says, and think about that, ponder that. And I will make mention of Rahab. Now, don't be, don't, that's not the Rahab the harlot in Jericho. This, this Rahab here speaks of Egypt, okay? So it says, I will make mention of Rahab in Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistine, and Tyre, and Ethiopia, this one was born there. And of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. So there'll be so many of the people during this specific time that I'll mention in a moment that will say, Zion is my mother. That's where I was born. And the Most High God himself shall establish her. And the Lord, it says, will record when he registers the peoples, meaning the citizens of Jerusalem, 
This one was born there, Selah. Aren't you glad that we've been born too, but we've been born from above, amen? So when we, they mentioned Babylon and, and, and Egypt and, and so forth, and the word Rahab means tumult. So there's going to be an uproar going on at that time. We know that this uh, psalm speaks of the, the millennial reign of Christ Jesus when he returns, when Jerusalem will be the capital of the entire earth. Amen? And look at what the celebration that takes place there in verse 7. He says, both the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs or all of my fountains are in you. Let me read from the German Bible for a moment. It says it this way, all dance for joy and all sing, O Zion, in you we are home. So the psalmist is saying, that there in the millennial reign, the, that every blessing that comes upon all of us, that we will be there with the Lord. Amen? Yes, that's the, the thousand-year reign. The rapture occurs before that time, and we come back with the Lord at the second coming. So it says that this is going to be a celebratory time, a wonderful time, as we are there with our Lord. Now let's look at Psalm 85, and we're going to talk about that God is ready tonight. It says in Psalm 85, to the chief musician, the psalm of the sons of Korah. So here is a prayer that's being prayed, asking God to restore, if you will, favor to the land. And when you see the land, it's not talking about soil there. It's talking about the people who live on the land, and that's the people of Israel. Amen? Very important to see that. Now listen, a lot of scholars, and they're all brilliant people, they believe that Psalm 85 speaks of the return of Judah from Babylonian captivity. However, the truth of the matter is, no one is really certain where this psalm, the historical setting, or even the time this psalm was written. So I'm not going to put any of those things in there, like the captivity or so forth. I'm going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So in verse 1, it says, Lord, look at this prayer now. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people and look what else God has done. You have covered all their sin, Selah. You know, that is really, if you're studying in your quiet time, that word Selah, pause, rest, take a break, really ponder what the psalmist has just said in his, from his heart, powered by the Holy Spirit. That's a good place to ponder that. Because, loved one, listen, I'm going to ask you a question. What is greater than when he says, oh, let your divine favor rest upon our land, your people? What is greater than having the divine, uh, divine grace or favor, uh, uh, the unmerited favor, the undeserved favor of the living God in your life? Do you know the Bible says in Romans 5, 2, that we stand, all of us that are believers, we stand in the grace of God 24-7? That's, that's our privilege to be able to do it because of what Christ has done. What greater is to live in a nation, if you will, that has God's unmerited favor resting upon it there's nothing greater than that what is greater than knowing in your heart that every sin that you have ever committed will commit the bible says that jesus paid for the sin of the world remember that tonight when you hold the cup and the bread in your hand would you remember that with all of your heart, knowing that God has forgiven us, that we are cleansed because of what Christ has done? He says, and you've taken away all your wrath. You've turned from the fierceness of your anger. And here comes that word, and this is what God is so ready to do in our lives and in their lives. And he prays, restore us. Say that with me restore us let that be our prayer right now do we need is there an area of our life that god that we need to it needs to be restored then lord let's have it amen he says restore us O god of our salvation and cause your anger toward us to cease will you be angry with us forever will you prolong your anger to all generations so he says restore us bring us back the lord to what we used to have, all of our, all of our uh, wonderful blessings that you blessed us with, restore us to our former condition. You know, one of the greatest psalms ever written is the 23rd Psalm, amen? When David cries out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Remember that one? Isn't that wonderful to know? He says, he says also in Psalm 23, 3, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And what does he do? He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of 
righteousness for his name's sake. Listen, I shall not, you shall not ever want for restoration for the Lord is our shepherd. Maybe tonight, I just talked to someone earlier and they said, I am so tired. I am so worn out. You know what? You know what you need to do? I know that feeling. You know when you don't sleep all night? You know what I'm saying? And you're just exhausted? Man, listen, he restores our soul. Boy, do we need that. Listen, maybe you're tonight, you're so heavy in your heart. Maybe there's a heaviness just resting upon you. I'm telling you, reach out to the only person who can restore, and that is Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. Sometimes our mind is just weary. And you know what? You can grow weary in well-doing, can't you? And God says, listen, Jesus' favorite thing is to restore. And you know it says that we, we walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Would you remember that tonight when you hold the cup in your hand and the bread in your hand that Jesus who died for us and we have believed in him has imputed his, God has imputed his perfect righteousness into our account. Amen. When God sees us in Christ, he sees us as perfect as Christ. That is our position, of course, not our practice, loved one. Now, you know what? One of the most misunderstood scriptures about restoration is in Galatians 6, 1. And few practice it today, where it says this, Brethren, if a man, we can say, or a woman, any Christian that's overtaken in any trespass, overtaken doesn't mean caught, I caught you. No, overtaken means I slipped. Trespass means you slipped, you crossed the line. You didn't want it, but you just did it. Do you understand? He says, oh, you who are spiritual, it says, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You who are spiritual, not, the, not you who, I know the Bible backwards and forwards. Oh, I can speak Hebrew and Greek. I even know a little delicatessen that's Jewish too. You know what I'm saying? No, listen to me now. You who are spiritual means this. It means you're not a legalist. You're not a Pharisee. You who are spiritual means those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who walk in the Spirit and are led by the Spirit. Amen? Now, those are the people that can restore. That word means to take a broken arm, for example. It's a medical word in the Greek. And your arm is broken. It means to mend it, to bring it back and let it be functioning again, not kicked out of the church. I, I don't know why I got off on that. Maybe some of you needed that. <laughs> Verse 6. Now, we, we want to be restored, and we have been restored. We haven't been remodeled. We're, we're new creations, amen? But here it goes. He prays. He says, oh, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you or we could read it at, may your people rejoice in you alone and absolutely no one else so revive us give us you know get us off of the respirator lord and we've been flatlining give us back our life amen some of us may need to be revived tonight only a believer by the way can be revived did you know that yeah, see, unbelievers, they, they, can't, they, they have to be born again because they are dead, spiritually dead, in trespasses and sins. And the only way for an unbeliever to be revived is for him, God, to, to, to change his life, to make him that new creation. Did you know that revival, true revival, always causes us to glory in the Lord Jesus alone? Amen. A.W. Tozier said this. He says, it's difficult to get Christians to attend any meeting where God or Jesus is the only center of attraction. Isn't that something? Yeah. In other, he goes on and he says, no, today we have to have entertainment. We have to have fried chicken. You know what I'm saying? Food. Christians love to eat. He says, he says, no, he says, it's difficult to get Christians to attend any meeting where God or Jesus is the only center of attraction. But see, the psalmist says this. He said, oh, that your people may rejoice in God alone and no one else. Listen to me. You know what revival is and how much we need it today among the, in the church? Revival is this. Picture the church in a coffin. What a horrible thought, isn't it? The church is in a coffin, and God says, it's time for revival. And I'm going to lift you up out of that death trance that you're in. And, man, I'm going to speak life into you. And God says, are you ready? Are you ready to live for God? 
You know, the, the, the great prayer that Solomon prayed in 2 Chronicles 7, 2 Chronicles 7 14 is just not for Jerusalem. It's just not for the people of Israel. It's for all people of God. He says in 714 of Chronicles, he says, if my people, and we are God's people, amen, who are called by my name, and we are, he says, if you will humble yourselves. Boy, there needs to be humility in the church today. We need to be humble ourselves to one another. You know, Christianity, loved one, made others important. Amen? He says, if we'll humble ourselves, if we'll pray, seek God's face, and turn from their wicked ways, God says this, okay, I'll hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. I'll tell you, this land that we love needs to be healed. We need a healing in our nation. My gosh, we need God to revive this nation. He says, oh, show us, I love this, show us your mercy. In other words, the word show means manifest let us experience your mercy O god he says and grant us your salvation rescue us save us you know that's what this world that we live in needs they need their blind eyes open to see the mercy of god there is no one more merciful than our lord he says in verse 8 and i will hear what god the lord will speak for he will speak peace to his people to his saints but let them not turn back to folly don't go in other words i'll speak peace to you but listen don't go back into sin Get, stay away from all of those things you know the bible says that god has spoken uh, spoken unto us in these last days by prophets and other areas and so forth but really it goes on to say has spoken unto us through his son jesus christ man listen jesus is our peace do you know that jesus is really the only peace in the world there is no peace without Jesus. Remember what he told his disciples in John 14, 27. Jesus said this, peace I leave with you. My peace. Think about that. My peace. The very peace of the Prince of Peace. He says, my peace I give to you. You didn't earn it. Give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart be not troubled, and neither let it be afraid. You know what's wonderful to know? Is the world that we live in, what Jesus has given unto us, the world cannot take it away. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying we have peace all the time, but we do have peace all the time. We just don't experience it all the time because we let other things try to come in and take it away from us. You, the, the world can't take away what God has given unto his children. Amen? It's an impossibility. And boy, we belong to God. I'm going to ask you a question. Is there peace on earth tonight? Huh? Is there peace in this nation tonight? Is there peace in Israel tonight? Is there peace in India tonight? Oh, dear God. I pray that you're praying for India. Man, they need our prayers. Amen. What's happening over there with this COVID and all that. Oh, listen, is there peace really in Russia? No, there's no peace in Russia. Is there peace in the White House? No, but there is peace in God's house if we want that peace. Well, I do. I want it with all my heart. The world is the craziest place that I've ever seen. You know, I don't know if you caught the, uh, wherever it was, the missiles that were being fired. The Iranians were coming up on the, our boats, and we fired those missiles, you know, what was it, yesterday or whatever. And, and I started thinking, here we are, the world talks about, let's, we're going to have peace. But then as they talk about peace, they start preparing for war. I mean, it's like, there's something not right up here. Do you know what I mean? I use that expression, the cheese has slid off the cracker, you know, talking about me. And it's a true word. It's okay. It is really leaving quickly these days. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the cheese is really slid off the cracker in the world that we live in. Listen, the world tells us lies all the time. It, it's always telling us, promising peace, but it's powerless to give us that peace. Matter of fact, the world steals the peace from people, doesn't it? Oh, listen. I'm so thankful tonight. What is it? Ephesians 2.14. Talking about Jesus. He himself is our peace. And to have his peace is to have his presence. Amen. I feel I sense his presence right now. He's right here with us because we're getting ready to celebrate his table, loved one. He says, oh, surely his salvation is near to those who what? Fear him. 
Now watch this. That glory may dwell in our land. Remember glory may dwell. That's talking about the manifest presence of the living God. What would happen just for one day in this nation that we live in that is so messed up right now? And you say, Bill, you're depressing. I'm not depressing. You know it's true. So do I. But listen, here's the deal. What would happen just one day in the morning that all of America, we woke up and there was a, a cloud by day over us and a pillar of fire by night. Oh, listen, think about that for a moment. You know what that represents, don't you? The pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. It represents the manifest presence of the living God and only nation on earth that ever had the manifest presence of God was the nation of Israel as they went through the wilderness. Think about that. Man, I mean, what would, and you think about the manifest presence of God. Listen to me now. Loved one, we, are we the church of the living God? Are we the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit? Are we the body of Christ, which, which Jesus is the supreme head of not only the church, but the entire universe? And all power and authority has been given to, unto him in heaven and upon earth? Well, that means this. It means that the church, which is his body, should manifest the glory of Jesus Christ on this earth. Do you understand? But we have to follow him. We have to walk. And he says in verse 10, oh, mercy and truth. They've met together. Okay. And watch this one. And righteousness and peace. Look what they've done. They've kissed. Well, I'm going to tell you what, that, that, that kiss didn't last very long. You know what I mean? I mean, it must have been a smooch. No, you know what I mean? Because we look around and I go, dear Lord, you know, the world doesn't want this kind of righteousness and doesn't want this kind of peace. Listen, there is only one way to have peace on this earth, and that is to be right with God. And you cannot be right with God unless you are in Christ Jesus. Amen? You have to be born from above. You know, we don't have peace in this nation because we don't have righteousness. No. The Bible says in Proverbs uh, 1434, righteousness exalts a nation, lifts a nation up. But sin is a reproach to any people. Look at verse 11. Truth shall spring out of the earth. And here comes that word again. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, Lord, we'll give what is good. And our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make, I love this, his footsteps our path. You know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 1.8, it says, but the son of, but to the son, he, meaning God says, your throne, O God, he just called God, called Jesus God. He's eternal. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. The Bible tells the Christian, what does it say? Seek ye first, Jesus said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. There is no one like Jesus. Amen? And Jesus rules in righteousness. He hates lawlessness. lawlessness. He rules in righteousness. And it says that his footsteps are our pathway. And that means that if you want to get into his footsteps, you have to get on the narrow road, the narrow way. Amen? That leads to life. And few be there that find it. It, it means that, that we have to uh, uh, follow him. It's, you know, it says, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So if we're going to get onto that pathway, it begins at the foot of the cross. That's where it all begins, the cross of Christ. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, he says, here are the conditions. He said, let him deny himself. You're not the boss anymore. Let him deny himself, disown himself. And he says, take up his cross daily and follow me. And also his pathway, where does it lead? It leads us to Christ's likeness, being made in his own image. Amen. That's the pathway of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 John 2, 6, it says that he who says he abides in him must walk just as he walked, meaning upon this planet. You know, the best thing we can do right now, all of us, every day of our lives, if we're going to stay in his footsteps, we have to do what it says in Ephesians 5, 1, where it says, and be ye imitators of God as dear children. In other words, dear children, that means we are the offspring of God. We are sharers of his divine nature. Amen. He says, if you're going to follow after me, if you're going to walk in my footsteps, 
then imitate God. What a, what a great word. He says, imitate God as dear children. Here it is. And walk in love. Boy, that's what we need to do. Love never fails. Love doesn't always win, but love never fails. He says, oh, walk in love. How? As Christ also loved us and given himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. What a great psalm. Now look at the prayer of David, Psalm 86. David is in trouble here. He says, oh God, he says, bow down your ear. In other words, that's like saying, Lord, would you come closer to me? You know, lean over and come close. He says, and Lord, I want you to hear me. And look at the reason. He says, for I am poor. Now that doesn't mean that, that he doesn't have a a, a shekel in his pocket or whatnot it meant that david you know uh, he was afflicted he was going through a, a bad time he says i'm not only afflicted but i he says and i'm needy in other words i'm in misery and look at the prayer now he says preserve my life don't let me die and look at the reasons but do you pray like david look at this look at the reasons that david gives preserve my life oh god he says for I am holy. When is the last time you went in your prayer time and you said, oh, Lord, this is Bill. I have a little need here because, you know, Lord, hear me because I want you to know I'm a holy. My name is Holy Bill. Well, that word, we are all made holy because we're in Christ, set apart for God. But David is not saying I am holy. What he's saying is I'm a faithful man to you. I'm devoted to you. I'm dedicated to you. I'm in love with you, Lord. I'm your servant. He says, Lord, look at that. I want you to hear me. And look at the reason. He says, for you are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord. That's Adonai. Seven times in this psalm, he uses that for God's supreme power, supreme sovereignty. He says, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long, rejoice or I, I like a better translation make me glad <laughs> don't you like that have you ever prayed that i have lord i am miserable make me glad i don't care what it takes just make me glad tonight he says oh make me glad because i serve you lord the soul of your servant for to you O oh lord i lift up my soul or, or uh, i worship only you god and no one else now listen that is a what you, is that a bold prayer? Come on, that David, man, that is what I call a great prayer, but it's a prayer of boldness. He says, "Lord, this is who I am." And in, this is the Holy Spirit recorded this, amen, through David. Amen. Listen. Man, why would David pray like that? I'll tell you why. Because David know, knew something that is almost forgotten today and, it, and we know get the answer in the very next verse. Watch it. He goes, for you, Lord, are what? You're good. You, that, you know, that's why you've heard all these years. I open God is good. I, I, that's, if there's anything I have a revelation on, not that I'm a, some kind of super saint, I just know God is good. He's so good to me. He has been so good to this church. I'm telling you that God is good. He doeth good. The scripture says he continues to do good. Listen, all God has done is good. All God did is good. All that God will do is going to be good. Amen? God is good. That's who he is. That's his attribute. And that's why he prayed the way he did. He says, oh, for you, Lord, you are good. But watch this. And ready to what? Say it with me. Ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to how many people to all those who call upon him listen i'm gonna ask you a question do you you came in here tonight maybe you're listening live maybe you're at home maybe you're upset right now maybe you've done things you shouldn't have done you go i need forgiveness okay now listen to me god says i tell you what i'm not only ready to restore you i'm not only ready to revive you i am ready to forgive you right this very minute but you have to call upon me you have to come to me that's what he just, david just said amen the bible says in first john what one nine if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness just confess 
Oh, Lord, you're so ready to forgive. What a great God that we serve. And not only that, it says that he is overflowing or he is abundant in mercy. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103.8 about not forgetting, remember, all of his benefits and so forth, who heals all of our diseases, and it says, and who forgives all of our iniquities. And then in verse 8, it says, oh, the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He says, oh, he's, he's not punished us. He has not dealt with us according to our sins or punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Oh, what a great scripture. You know what the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 4? But God, who is rich in mercy... That means overflowing, abundant, unbelievable, unlimited mercy. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love. When did God show us his great love? Romans 5, 8, remember? God demonstrated, that word means proved. God proved his own love for us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? He proved it at Calvary. He says, oh, because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, living for self and loving self and loving darkness before we were born again. He says he has made us alive together with Christ. For grace you have been saved. Mercy, loved one, is what every one of us needed and still need. It means God's undeserved kindness. Gosh, God is good. He is always good. Verse 6, Oh, give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I fell apart. I called my pastor. <laughs> That's not in there, I know. I, I just like to torment you sometimes. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you. And look at this faith of what does he say? He says, for you will answer me. You know, where do you really, love one? Now listen, let's be honest tonight. We're about to celebrate the Lord's table. Where do you really turn in your day of trouble? What's the first thing you turn to? Who do you turn to? Or what do you turn to? I mean, is today your day of trouble? If it is, listen to me. Then do what the psalmist did. He says, I'm going to the Lord. And I'm going to call upon the Lord, and he is going to answer me. And you know what's really sad? You know this, I know this. Many believers today, they are in trouble, and they're going through trouble, and they go through it for all the wrong reasons. Let me give you a few examples. Job 4.8. Even as I have seen, Job says, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble will reap the same. That is a true word. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is a universal law. Amen? It says in Proverbs 15, 27, He who is greedy for gain troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. You know, listen, and then a lot of times we turn to people when we're in trouble. Listen to this, Psalm 108, 12. Give us help from trouble, O God, for the help of man is useless. That doesn't mean that we can't, that iron doesn't sharpen iron, that there's not wis there is wisdom in the multitude of counselors, but in the end of it, only God is our true help. Amen? Oh, it, it tells us in Psalm 46, 1, for God is our refuge, he is our strength, a very present help in trouble. You're in trouble right now? He's right there. He's present tense. He's with you this very, very moment. Verse 8, and among the gods there's none like you, O Lord, nor are there, are there any works like your works. Now watch, all nations, not a few, but all, all nations whom you've made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. And here's the reason why. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Loved one, we know that's not going to happen until the second coming. Amen. When Jesus comes back, it says, the Bible tells us in Zechariah, in the day that Jesus comes back at the second coming, it says that Jesus, our Lord, will be, shall be king over all the earth. That day is yet future. But I love this next scripture. 
verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. And he says, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Have you ever prayed like that? Why don't you pray like that tonight? Take that scripture and just say, oh, oh Lord, teach me. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. I, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Verse 11 is a great scripture. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. How do you do that? You know how you do it? You open up your Bibles. Amen? Every day of your life. You open up your Bible, and, and guess what's going to happen? As you read, as you, you know, like I always, most of the time in my prayers, before I walk out here to teach, I, I pray what the psalmist has said, Oh, Lord, show me wondrous things from thy word tonight, or it's Sunday morning. You understand? And here, you know, if we open our Bibles, guess what's going to happen? We start reading, the spirit of truth will teach you. Isn't that great that we have the greatest teacher in all of the universe, the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells us in John 16, 3, Jesus said this to the disciples. He said it to us as well. He says, however, when he, see the Holy Spirit is a person, not a language, not a force, not an essence, not an, he is a person. He's the third person of the Godhead. It says, when he, the spirit of truth or the, uh, the source of all truth has come, listen to carefully. He will guide you into all truth, meaning all spiritual truth, all the truth that's found in God's Word. Isn't that incredible? I mean, we have the greatest teacher and the greatest help prayer partner in all of the world, the Holy Spirit. Oh, listen, that is a great, great scripture, loved one. You know, when the Holy Spirit, the divine helper of the church, when he is given his proper place in your life, the Christian's life, and in the church, you know what happens? Then the church will manifest Jesus Christ upon this planet. And that's what is needed. When we open our Bibles and we learn, the Holy Spirit teaches us. And not only that, when we obey it or apply it, you apply what you learn, guess what happens? You start walking in God's truth, and you do so by the Word of God and by the power of another, the Holy Spirit of God. Someone quoted and said this, where the Holy Spirit is work, there must, where the Holy Spirit is at work, there must be truth. That's a great word, isn't it? Oh, listen. And then he says again, he says, unite my heart to fear your name. He says, He's praying, and he says, oh, God, listen, would you give me just a single heart? I don't want to be a double-hearted person. I don't want to be a double-minded man. I want my heart to be single in honor, to honor you, to love you, to fear you. I want a singleness of heart. The German Bible puts it this way. Let my only concern be to honor you and to obey you. Do you remember when Jesus himself led Paul the apostle on the Damascus road uh, to himself to born again? What did Paul say? The first thing out of his mouth, Lord, what, must, what do you want me to do? Boy, see, God is always working. He's always wanting to lead us. And you know what a, a, the united heart really is? A united heart is one today who wants to obey the great commandment. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Amen? Yeah, and that's why he says it in the next verse, in verse 12. He says, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with how much of his heart? All of his heart. That's the great commandment, loved one. He says, and I will glorify your name forever. And as I keep reading, I'm going to ask the ushers, if you will, to start distributing the communion tonight. He says, I'll praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore, for great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. In other words, you've rescued, rescued me from the grave, or David really is saying, you've kept me from death, and look at the reason why. He was about to be killed, see? He says, O God, the proud, they've risen against me. A mob of violent men have sought my life, and they've not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God, and you're full of compassion, 
full of graciousness, full of long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. What is David doing? He's listing the attributes of God. He says, oh, turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant. Amen, David. Save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. And I say to David, what a great prayer. Amen, David. Listen to me now. As the communion is being passed out, I want you to, tonight, I want you to understand something. Don't forget tonight. Don't forget what's happening right now in your midst because this is relaunch. In other words, for the very first time in over a year, we're passing out communion the old way. The old way. Don't, don't forget tonight, would you? You see, we've been in the midst of a pandemic. We're still in a pandemic. But we're doing everything we can to get back the way it was, but in a greater way. Amen? We haven't, we're, we're moving forward. We're not moving backward. And tonight, we're passing this out. We're going to do it just like we've always done it in the old way. So if you're home, you're listening live uh, online, listen, I pray that you have the elements and you have them ready with your children, or maybe you're all by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Jesus is there with you. Amen? Now, I'm going to be reading as they're continuing to pass out the elements. Paul the Apostle writes about our service tonight. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when Jesus had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus said, This is my body which is broken for you, so you will never have to be broken. Amen. Do you understand? Maybe you're broken tonight. You feel broken. Your heart is broken, or you just, whatever. Jesus said, no, no. You're getting ready to hold in your hand the bread of life. And he says, he says listen, he says, I want you to take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Isn't that amazing that Jesus would say that? Do this, what we're about to do. He says, do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask you a question. How can we forget Jesus who has never forgotten us? Do you understand? He's never forgotten you. He'll never forget you. He will never even forsake you. You know how that literally reads when, it's when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me? He says this to the disciples, to us. He says, don't forget me when I'm gone away. When I've returned home to my Father, when I go back to heaven, don't forget me. How can we ever forget what he has done for me? And he says, this is my body which was mangled and broken and beaten and bruised. And he says, it was done for you. We were so broken, loved one, in Adam. You know what I mean? I mean broken in Adam, so separated from God, living for self, living for the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and all of that. We were living broken lives, and we didn't know it, and we were living on broken things, and we thought they were nourishment, but they were not nourishment. And now we can live through Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Oh, listen, in a few minutes, we're going to take and we're going to eat that bread, and when we do, we're going to remember what he did for us. We're going to remember all that he went through on the cross. We're going to look back and remember all that his death means to us. We'll never forget our Lord. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, blood speaks of death. He died on the cross for you and for me. As often, this do, as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. In a moment, we're going to partake of the bread. In a moment, we're going to partake of the cup. And as we do, Jesus said, now don't forget. Don't forget that you're partakers of a new covenant. Don't you dare forget that that cup represents my blood. I paid for it all. I paid. I died the death that you can, that for you. I tasted death for every person. Amen. I defeated sin, death, the grave, the devil, and all of it. And he did it all for us. He conquered them. Now listen, never forget 
that Jesus paid not only our sin debt, but the sin of the world. And loved one, listen, our debt has been paid in full. Therefore, Romans 8, 1, therefore, there is now, right now, and we can say, and forever and ever and ever, if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, no judgment to those who are in Christ. Yes, there's judgment at the Bema seat, the place of rewards, but we will never face the great white throne judgment. Amen? And he says there, he says, for as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, look what we do tonight. This is what we're going to be doing. You're going to be proclaiming, or literally that word means to herald or to preach, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he what? Until he comes. Now that's the catching away of the church. That's the rapture of the church. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow night. It may be in the middle of the night. No man knoweth the day or hour. Jesus said, only the Father. Amen? He just says, watch and be ready, for you know not when the Son of Man comes. No, we don't know, but he is coming. So we look back and thank the Lord for all that he's done. And then we look ahead and say, oh God, you're so good. Aren't you glad tonight? The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Aren't you glad tonight that we were redeemed not with corruptible things like from this aimless life like silver and gold, you know, those perishable things, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Oh, God is so good. We've been redeemed. We're a purchased people. We're the body of Christ. So now we look ahead, we look back, and now we're going to do one more thing. We're going to look inside of ourselves. It says, therefore, whoever eats this bread drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. In other words, without proper reverence, okay? And meaning that this can be done. It says, look what will happen. We'll be guilty of, meaning profaning and sinning against the body. Now that's the body which was broken for you and me. And the blood, the blood that was shed for us and purchased us of the Lord. Now, there's a lot of explanations for this, and they're all not right, okay? In other words, there are those that say, man, listen, if you come to this table without repentance of sin, you might be die, dead before you get home and watch the evening news. That's not, what the, that's not what Paul is writing here at all. You know, or you're saying that, you know, um, one of the things we should never do is come to this table and regard this as communion as a ritual. It's not a ritual. Jesus is present. He is here. Not in the bread and the cup. That's not, didn't change. These are symbols. Amen? Yes. Oh, loved one, listen to me. You know, it's a terrible thing to come to the Lord's table in a nonchalant manner. But the real reason that Paul said that you kept reading it, that many die, many are weak, and so forth, in, to know of what Paul is saying, to know, the con to, to know the text, read the context. What were the Corinthians doing at, at the Lord's Supper? Were they sharing their food? No. Were they getting wasted? Yes. Were, that meaning drunk. Were they drunk at the Lord's Supper? Yes. Now listen, were, were they divided and drunk? Yes. That's what they're talking about. That's what, that's what, in context, what that's meaning. That's when you don't discern the body of the Lord the right way. Aren't you glad that we're not doing that tonight? Yeah, we love one another. We're not divided, are we? Are you wasted? No. Oh, listen. Here it comes. But let a man, let a woman, let us all examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread, drink of the cup. And you know what? That's self-examination. Amen? So as I join in with you tonight, and as I make my way down on the floor, you know, I have to be careful, you know. I don't want to trip over Mario. He might not forgive me, and then he shouldn't partake of communion. <laughs> There's nothing greater than for us to be here tonight as family. Listen, I tell you, Jesus loves us. I tell you that Jesus is coming. I told a person earlier tonight, I said, you know, the only thing that matters in our life, loved one, is this is when you get to the end of your life, when you know that it's over, you know that God is going to call you home, you know you're going to take that last breath and there's not anything you can do about it. The only thing that matters is this. I live for Jesus Christ. 
I just lived for the Lord. I did, I, with all my heart, I did God's will. That's all that matters in that day, in that moment, when we pass from this place to our eternal home. It's not that you, I may, look what I did for my family, I'm rich and all that. No, 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 listen to me. It's that you said, Lord, here I am. My whole heart, I wanted it to be yours, and I did everything through the power and the grace that you gave me to serve you and to love you. Now take me home. That's all that matters. So tonight, through your incredible love, your marvelous mercy, your incredible peace that you've given unto us. As the family of God, O oh Lord, we hold this bread in our hand. And what we do now, we do in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, let us partake of the bread. As we practice self-examination right now, look into your heart. Do you have aught? I'm not saying you do, but do you? Have you been wronged, hurt, wounded, whatever? Why don't you let them go? Why don't you let God have them? He'll take care of them. Amen? So forgive those. Forgive them. You know, whatever... Maybe there's something that you know, say, Lord, I'm, I, you know I'm, I have a stronghold. There's something just, uh, just won't let me go. God knows that. Let me tell you something. Why don't you say, I can't make that happen, but I know you can. Why don't you quit trying and say, I'm giving it to Jesus. Why don't you let the one who loves you and paid for your sin, tasted death for you. Why don't you say, Lord, there it is. I believe your promise. I believe that you've redeemed me. You've bought me. You've purchased me. You chose me before the foundation of the earth. And Lord, I know I'm going to make it because you're going to take it from me. Ask him tonight. Examine yourself, whatever it might be. Oh, Lord, as we do so, as we all look inwardly, Lord, we want to find nothing but Jesus. That's it. We want to find total room for our Savior and nothing else. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for taking our sin and our shame and our guilt. And thank you for taking our punishment that we deserve. Thank you. Oh God, thank you. Tonight, we partake of the cup. And as we do, we not only proclaim your death until you come back for us, Lord. But all that we do now, we do in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, let us partake. Father, we thank you tonight for you being with us in such a tangible way. I thank you, Lord, that the things that we've learned tonight, and Lord, I don't know what that means, but if it's bad, then I know that you know more about it than I do. But Lord, we just love you, and we give you praise tonight. I thank you, Father. I personally thank you because I love it, Lord, when I know that you're here. Where, where, in other words, I always know you're here, Lord, but tonight I, I sensed your presence in such a great way. I thank you for that because I needed, I needed your embrace. I needed it. They needed it. We praise you for that. So, Lord, we're going to conclude tonight. I pray you give everyone a safe journey home. And that, Lord Jesus, I pray as we stand to our feet and we're going to sing and we're going to close out that every need be met tonight in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to close with a song. Jesse's going to take us home. And when the song is over, loved one, listen, if you need prayer.
then there'll be people down here to pray with you. I love you dearly. The Lord bless you and keep you. Let's sing to the Lord. Seems my soul. Church, be safe going home. We'll see you Sunday.